Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Egyptian ex-minister sentenced to 15 years over Israel gas deal. Jordan King asks MPs to amend contested electoral law. And Palestinian prisoner on verge of death as he enters 78th day of hunger strike. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East begins now. In Egypt, the Cairo Criminal Court issued a verdict to imprison former Minister of Petroleum Sameh Fahmi, fugitive businessman Hussein Salam, and five other former high-ranking officials in the Ministry of Petroleum. While the civil lawyers welcomed the verdicts, the defense lawyers decided to appeal the decisions. As for the relatives of the defendants, they had another opinion. Immediately after the announcement of the verdict to imprison seven officials for a total of 50 years, a storm of anger took over the relatives of the former high-ranking officials, who are accused of squandering public money by selling Egyptian gas to Israel at a low price. The biggest share of the verdict was for Sameh Fahmi, former Minister of Petroleum, who was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Fugitive businessman Hussein Salem received the same sentence. Binding all defendants jointly to the amount of 2 billion, 300 million, 319,000 and 675 US dollars. The defense lawyers vowed to appeal the verdicts. We have no comment on the verdicts, but we will follow the legal procedure to petition and appeal them. However, civil lawyers considered these verdicts historic. This is the first case in Egypt in which ministers of the petroleum industry have been sentenced. They sold the country's resources very cheaply. This can be considered a warning and a vow to anyone who intends to do such a thing in Egypt in the future, and it is a big success for the revolution. The verdict's announcement was preceded by tight security measures and came after 49 hearings over an entire year. With these verdicts, the case of exporting gas to Israel is closed, following seven years of popular disapproval and political turmoil. This turmoil came about after Egypt signed a treaty in 2005 to sell gas to Israel at prices well below international market prices. This brought losses to Egypt estimated at hundreds of millions of dollars. Samir Hassan, Al Jazeera, Cairo. Egyptian President-elect Mohamed Morsi denied what he described as allegations to turn Egypt into a Muslim Brotherhood state. And in a meeting with the heads of political parties and editorial directors, Morsi said that his actual goal is to have rapport between all political forces. He noted that he will announce the prime minister within the next few days and that the presidency will later announce the location where he will take the oath of office. The president-elect also called for the elimination of the terms confrontation and mistrust from the political dictionary. Jordan's King Abdullah II sent the electoral law back to Parliament to be reviewed and amended. This comes after the Islamic Action Front Party issued a request to send the law back and form a national unity government. The Jordanian king responded to the Islamic Action Front's request and sent the electoral law back to Parliament. The political wing of the Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan requested that the king send the law back, saying the law will have negative effects on the economic and social situation of the country. The party also called for forming a national rescue government. Parliament recently passed a bill for this year's elections. According to the bill, each voter 
will be allowed two votes. One of them will go to local candidates and the other to a relatively closed national list consisting of 17 representatives. Since last year, Jordan has been seeing wide-scale protests and demonstrations for various causes, be they political, social or economic. Politically, a constitutional monarchy was proposed amid discussions among political parties who demand fundamental change in the infrastructure of the regime's institutions. The calls for reform, which include drafting an electoral law, focus on attaining more rights for Jordanians. A large number of Jordanians took to the streets demanding an end to corruption and an end to the security institutions that the protesters say have exceeded their constitutional role. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas will meet with Israeli Vice Prime Minister Shaul Mofaz this coming Sunday. This will be the first meeting of this level since peace talks between the Palestinians and Israelis failed in 2010. Chief Palestinian negotiator Saeb Erekat said in his statements on Radio Palestine that the Abbas Mofaz meeting comes after the latter asked to convene it. However, a spokesman for the Israeli Vice Prime Minister did not confirm or deny arranging the meeting. Senior Hamas member Kamal Ranaja has been assassinated in Damascus. The Hamas terror group issued an official statement confirming the death and saying that a number of people entered Ranaja's home in the Syrian capital and killed him, although no details were given about how the murder took place. A Hamas source in Gaza said there were marks of torture on Ranaja's body and indirectly accused Israel of being involved in the killing. Sources added that an investigation has been launched. However, the Syrian opposition accused Syrian President Bashar al-Assad of being responsible for the killing. A delegation of senior Hamas officials, including Khaled Masha'al and Musa Abu Marzouk, will travel to Jordan to attend the funeral. In the past, Renaja served as a personal aide to Mahmoud al-Mabhuk, a senior Hamas operative who took part in numerous terrorist attacks and was also involved in kidnapping and killing IDF soldiers. Mabhuk was assassinated in 2010 in a Dubai hotel room. His killing was also blamed on Israel's Mossad agency. A potential coalition crisis is brewing over the proposed Plessner Committee law regulating the draft of ultra-Orthodox youth to the army. None of those involved in the negotiations appear to be at this stage relenting on their demands. We get more now on this report from Dennis Zinn. Sources close to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today said that the ultra-Orthodox parties, including Shas, will fiercely oppose the Plesner Committee proposals for the draft of yeshiva students. According to the plan, Haredi youth will be entitled to defer conscription until the age of 22, when they will have to decide whether to opt for military duty in the IDF or national service in a civilian capacity. Those yeshiva students who enlist at an earlier age will be rewarded with financial benefits, and others who evade draft will be sanctioned. The ultra-religious parties are ignoring the proposals and refuse to enter negotiations over the terms. Deputy Minister Yaakov Litzman of the United Torah Judaism Party said encouraging military draft is acceptable, but he rejects punishing students for not wanting to give up their studies. He said that the rabbis will not allow their pupils to join the army and the military police will have to carry out mass arrests. Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman said he rejects the Plessner Committee recommendations because the army needs young 18 to 22 year old combat soldiers. Besides, he said, most ultra-Orthodox men are married at 22 and have families to take care of. The expense, he said, will be enormous and the benefits minimal. A married conscript with children earns ten times more than a young frontline soldier. And the demonstrators at the so-called suckers camp who are demanding equal service for all said they are extremely disappointed with the proposed law. Plesner, they said, promised a revolution in military conscription and has come up with a lemon. Dennis Zinn, IBA News. The Palestinian Prisoner Society and rights organizations warned of prisoner Akram al-Rakawi's deteriorating health condition. Al-Rakawi, who suffers from several diseases, has entered his 78th day of hunger strike.
For eight years, a mother and three children have been awaiting the day Akram al Rakawi, who entered his 78th day of hunger strike, would be released. At a military checkpoint between Gaza and Khan Yunus, occupation forces arrested al Rakawi in 2004 and sentenced him to nine years in prison, leaving his children and wife waiting for the day of his return. A lawyer visited him and said, this is not the Abu Marwan that I know. We're pulling words out of him. His health is very poor and he's very tired. He's in a coma and when he gets an asthma attack, he suffocates and feels like he's going to die. This is the situation of al Rakawi, who is staying at the hospital in al Ramla prison after he suffered from asthma and other diseases and after he refused to submit to the prison's measures to chain him up while transporting him to the hospital. I am sending a message to all people with a conscience to intervene in my father's case and help release him because we want to see him and be with him. Al Rakawi's lawyers are exerting tremendous efforts to secure his release after serving two thirds of his sentence. But all efforts failed, and Akram, a resident of Yebna refugee camp in Rafa, will complete his journey of hardship between prison and the hospital. This case is complicated, as the opposition sentenced him to nine years in jail, and the prison term will end in June next year. Therefore, there is supposed to be an intervention on the political level as well to settle this case. Akram al Rakawi, 39 years old, shares his fellow prisoners' endurance of all forms of physical and psychological torture, which domestic and international human rights organizations have repeatedly condemned. The organizations such as Adala and Beit Salim, as well as other organizations, have filed hundreds of complaints against Israeli investigators, but the occupation provides immunity to the investigators while legitimizing their practices of torture against the Palestinian detainees. Therefore, none of them were held accountable. So Akram al Rakawi will remain in this situation, struggling for a dignified life threatened by death at every moment. Ajwa Jaradat, Palestine TV. The UN envoy to Syria, Kofi Annan, is exerting new efforts to solve the Syrian crisis, while violence still dominates the situation in the country. Annan proposed the formation of a transitional government that includes both supporters and opponents of al-Assad. The proposal was accepted by major powers, including Moscow, which asserted that the Russians and Syrians agree that a transitional phase is necessary. Hani Nasser reports. Realizing that his six-point plan will not bring about the desired results, the UN envoy to Syria, Kofi Annan, comes bearing a new package of plans that is perhaps better than the previous one to end the Syrian conflict, which has entered its 16th month. The international mediator's proposal entails forming a transitional government in Syria that includes both supporters of President Bashar al-Assad and members of the opposition. The transitional government will not include any official whose presence may harm the transitional process and undermine the government's credibility. The proposal seems to have received acceptance from major powers, including Russia, which will discuss the new Annan plan at the summit of the Action Group for Syria in Geneva. The group does not include Iran and Saudi Arabia. The objectives of the Action Group for Syria are to identify steps and measures to secure full implementation of the six-point plan and the Security Council resolutions 2042 and 2043, including an immediate cessation of violence in all its forms. The Action Group for Syria should also agree on guidelines and principles for a Syrian-led political transition that meets the legitimate aspirations of the Syrian people.
However, does the new plan and the transition mean President Bashar al-Assad will be removed? Western diplomats believe that the picture Anand has painted suggests the possibility of removing Assad, as well as removing certain officials in the opposition, though they insist that there is nothing in the Anand proposal that will automatically remove President Assad. This speculation leads to another question. Does the approval of Moscow, Assad's most important ally, mean that Russia is ready for Assad to step down? It is clear that in order to overcome the Syrian crisis, there must be a transitional phase. But the Syrian people themselves should determine the details and the approach for this phase to a dialogue that includes the Syrian government. This is what we approved of. Meanwhile, Washington's position is straightforward on the new Annan plan. We believe it embodies the principles needed. We believe it embodies the principles needed for any political transition in Syria that could lead to a peaceful, democratic, and representative outcome, reflecting the will of the Syrian people. The implementation of the new plan or the new proposal remains uncertain. It may receive the same fate as the previous one. However, an even more important question remains. Do Assad and the institutions around him approve of the plan? Our tensions are on the rise in the region as Turkey beefs up troops along its border with Syria. This after Syrian forces shot down a Turkish jet fighter over its territorial waters and Turkey has threatened to retaliate. Let's take a look at the ongoing unrest in Syria and the role Turkey and other regional countries including Saudi Arabia have played in it so far. A Turkish army convoy moving toward the border with Syria. Ankara began a troop build-up along the Syrian border after Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan threatened Damascus with retaliation over the downing of a Turkish jet fighter by the Syrian forces. The Syrian government says the jet fighter was flying over its territory. But Turkey denies this and claims the aircraft was flying over international waters. Tensions have increased between the two neighbors in recent months Syria accuses Turkey of involvement in the deadly unrest that has plagued the Arab country since 2011. Ankara does not deny this and has openly called for Syria's President Bashar al-Assad to step down. Turkey's border is also the main route through which weapons are smuggled into Syria for use by the armed groups. Syria is not attacking Turkey. I don't see any Syrian tanks going to the Syrian borders or across that border. I don't see any Syrian aircraft, you know, flying over Turkey. But on the other hand, you see Turkey is supporting the opposition, is, it, is moving inside even the, the, that Syrian land, and Syria is always trying to avoid any contact, military contact uh, with Turkey. As tensions begin to reach boiling point in the region, Saudi Arabia's King Abdullah commands his army to be on high alert for what he calls any eventuality. Given the tense situation in the region, which calls for utmost caution and readiness, you're expected to be on high alert for any foreign attack or criminal acts of terrorism. Saudi Arabia and Qatar are also active players in Syria's unrest. The weapons that end up in the hands of the anti-Syrian armed groups are known to be supplied by Riyadh and Doha. The two countries are also giving millions of dollars in aid to the armed gangs each month. Both Saudi Arabia and Qatar are close U.S. allies in the Persian Gulf and the Middle East. Syria calls its unrest a foreign-backed plot aimed at regime change in the country. However, Damascus is standing firm. It says that it will not give in to terrorists and will deal with them decisively. A strong explosion rocks the Syrian capital, Damascus, the target, the country's justice ministry. At least three people were injured and 20 cars were torched in the blast in the parking lot of the Palace of Justice. The area houses several courtrooms and buildings. This isn't the first bombing to hit Damascus. The city has been rocked by a wave of huge explosions in recent months. On Wednesday, gunmen stormed the headquarters of a Syrian television channel planting bombs in the building. Seven people, including three journalists, were killed in the attack on al ikhbari offices.
The streets of the Yemeni capital, Sana'a, witnessed demonstrations that were the first of their kind in the form of a procession of cars. Protesters chanted slogans demanding the ouster and trial of those loyal to former President Ali Abdullah Saleh, stressing the importance of continuing to mobilize the revolutionaries. Near Tagir Square in Sana'a, protesters in hundreds of cars gathered to prepare for a demonstration that was the first of its kind. The car procession covered most of the streets in Sana'a in a demonstration for change. Revolutionary youths say that it symbolizes the beginning of a new revolutionary mobilization with the aim of protecting the revolution through various methods. Today we are using a new method. We're trying to find innovative ways to help express our views. This car procession is one way to do it. It is a different form of protest, but the demands and slogans are the same. Protesters chanted slogans demanding the restructuring of the army and the ouster of the remaining Saleh loyalists, especially his son Ahmed, who still serves as the head of the Republican Guard, as well as arresting and trying all corrupt figures. Today's demonstration is a form of escalating the revolution with the aim of expelling the remnants of the deposed Ali Abdullah Saleh's regime. We are very determined. We will not engage in any discussion until the army is restructured and until we attain the demands of the youths who came out to protest. The issues of restructuring the army and the dialogue conference still preoccupy the revolutionary youths and politicians. Meanwhile, an international delegation headed by UN ambassador to Yemen Jamal bin Omar is due to arrive in Sana'a for a mission that's expected to last several weeks. The delegation will monitor and follow up on the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution No. 2014 pertaining to the power transfer deal, particularly to the restructuring of the army and the political dialogue. Every step toward a political compromise encounters many obstacles that impede the implementation process. It is an issue that some attributed to the shortcomings in the agreement's approach, which left out many important details, rendering its fate unknown. Ali al Dahab, Al Alam, Sanaa. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Wincote Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows, and more at linktv.org mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.